All righty, good morning. I'm Ken Olsop with Oskaloosa News, and I'm going to get on camera here so you can see I'm actually here in the office as well. So today, Ken Rosenboom is on his way, um, but we still have Holly Brink and Dustin Height in the office with us today. We're going to be, uh, I think this is our last legislative session, and you guys will be winding up here pretty soon, correct? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we have some coffee on the table. Thanks to Smokey Row and Midwest One for that. Um, back in, well, we have Andy and Allison McGuire. They're helping sort out questions. You can send your questions to the live Facebook feeds. Um, we have the Maska Chamber and Development and here on Oskaloosa News. I want to thank Penn Central Mall, KIIC, Oski News for the use of the studio, and... Uh, well, I'm going to turn this over to you guys, and we can start talking about where we're at right now. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, this week was definitely a busy week. We ran uh, several late nights. Um, we worked through a lot of the education pieces. Um, you know, it's coming to the end. Second funnel is next week. So we are working to diligently to uh, get everything done. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. So yeah, as Holly said, uh, we're approaching the second funnel, which basically means the policy bills, if they don't make it through their respective committees in uh, the other chamber, then they will be done for the, the rest of the year. And so I think now is the time that we start working on budgeting. So I've got about, about a month left in the session and um, look forward to your questions. All right. Well, I don't have anything yet that I'm seeing, so I'm going to kind of open this up with you guys have had some pretty late nights. Um, why, don't, why don't we kind of go through what your schedule has been and, and some of the, I mean, well, poor Holly, we just heard about her car not starting. So when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and your car don't start, that's a problem. So let's talk about why you were there at the State House so late that evening. So that day we actually ran um, several different bills. And one thing that's really important to Oskaloosa that I, in, in the surrounding areas um, you know, we, one of the things that came off the floor was an ambulatory surgical center um, bill that I had been working on um, for several years. Everybody probably knows about Ruben van Veldhuizen, and so um, I had been working on some different pieces of legislation to help with what happened there, and so um, we got the first piece off the floor that day, um, which uh, was very exciting, actually, um, but also emotional as well. Um, and that night, the reason we did go so late was uh, we were working on charter schools um, and the situation there. So it was, was it close to one? I don't even remember. It was yeah, it was a little bit after one when we got out, or at least when I got out of there. Um, but uh, as Holly said, Wednesday night we were debating, I believe it's House File 813, which dealt with uh, ch public charter schools in the state of Iowa. For those, uh, those unfamiliar, we currently, under current law, have a system for uh, public charter schools, and uh, they must be started by a local school board. There are two in the state. Uh, there's been a few more started, but uh, have, those have closed. And so this simply added another avenue for public charter schools to get started. Instead of applying to a local school board, they could apply directly to the, um, the State Board of Education. Uh, we also added some some transparency issues made sure that they're subject to open meetings and open records make sure that they have to accept any and all comers and educate all of the children that desire to go there unless they run out of space which it should be a lottery after that so that was the thing that took us through the late night on wednesday this week yeah and i can add also to that too i mean there's a lot of different pieces there's 27 different um pieces that need to go to open the charter schools. But again, it is public charter schools. It's stated in throughout the bill several times. I know there was a lot of people that talked that it was private. Um, these are public charter schools. Um, we did do several different changes to the original charter school situation or the legislation that was passed over. Um, and so it was, it's, we actually have an individual in our caucus that is uh, part of a charter school now in Iowa. So that helped us as well. So I'm really proud of what we came up with. All right. Well, we have gotten our first question that has come in, and, and it's just kind of a general one. So what piece of legislation are you the most proud of that you have worked on this session so far? Um, so I uh, came up with, filed, and we got 
through the House and it set over in a subcommittee in the Senate a, a redlining bill. So for those who are unfamiliar with the, the, uh, the topic of redlining, back uh, in the 1930s under the FDR administration uh, and part of the New Deal, the federal government came out with rules and regulations for banks and basically established uh, what they called risky lending areas and told banks not to issue mortgages and loans in those areas. But those areas also were um, majority black and other minority populations. And so essentially for a little over 30 30 years, uh, banks were essentially kept out of the mortgage market in those areas. And so when you take those maps and you look at the communities today, they still are some of the lower income and maybe the lower property condition uh, uh, areas in the cities. And so my bill simply created a process where the city or county could create a tax incentive program where if the homeowner invested 30% of the value of the property in their taxes, they could get their taxes abated for a period of 15 years on a decreasing basis. And so um, this was an attempt to remedy what truly is a, a systemic racism, uh, a policy implemented by the federal government back in the 1930s, continued for 30 years, and the effects are still seen today. And so um, there's been several news stories about it. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's probably the first one in the country to address this topic this way. And so I'm really proud of that piece of legislation. So while I'm proud, um, one of the reasons I ran um, you know, three years ago was the preschool situation. And for the first time, we got that off the House um, floor. And I'm really proud of that. But I would say probably the things that I'm most proud of really don't have to do with a bill yet. It's coming. Um, but it has to do with the Government Oversight Committee and just what has been brought about that protects teachers and students from that. I've been working with PEI now on situations um, that are happening across the state from what we've uncovered in a couple of our government oversight hearings. Um, and so I think that's probably not necessarily legislation, but what I'm most proud of working on. Um, and it's going to be coming forth with some different legislation here over the next year or so. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, it was a lot of protect, it will be dealing with protection of teachers and um, certain topics that they maybe aren't comfortable teaching as well as protecting students. So. All right, well, we have one from Andy McGuire, and he asks, could you give us some more information or more details about the no-permit gun legislation that is sitting on the governor's desk? What is the need for this bill, in your opinion? So uh, the permitless carry bill, uh, under current Iowa law, uh, there's no permit required to buy, carry, transfer, anything like that, um, long guns, shotguns and rifles. And there is a requirement under current law to have a permit to carry or permit to acquire to purchase uh, handguns, not to necessarily own or possess them. And so what this law basically did is say, um, you don't need that permit to, to conceal carry and you don't need that permit to purchase, uh, purchase handguns. Now, uh, one thing I think everybody should know is still to purchase handguns through an FFL dealer, you still have to go through the national background checks or uh, you can still get a permit to carry or a permit to acquire uh, and would then um, short circuit that uh, that background check process just the way it is today. And so really that's all it did is is remove that requirement. I think uh, the the impetus behind this is the Second Amendment. It's it's the Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights that uh, the right to keep and bear arms, and it's a little bit uh, strange to have to have a permit to exercise that right. And so this this bill simply said you don't need that permit, you don't need that government per permission slip to exercise your Second Amendment rights. As I said, you still have to go through background checks to purchase guns through an FFL dealer. Okay, well, and so I'll ask a, a little follow-up on this myself. S did this change any of the, the uh, standards as far as where a person could seal carry? I mean, we have currently, you know, schools, things like that, that you, you can't carry within. So did it change any of those rules for, for gun owners? The only thing it changed with regard to that, Ken, is uh, allowed off-duty police officers to uh, carry uh, carry firearms on school property. But other than that, it did not change anything. And the thought behind that is uh, these are off-duty sworn police officers uh, sworn to uphold the law to protect citizens. And so we think it's right that they uh, have the ability to carry a firearm in those situations. And, and that, that bill's been sitting on the governor's desk for a few days now. Um, 
Any idea when she'll plan on signing that, if at all? I think that's a question that we've all been asked several times. Um, you know, I believe that it was signed in the House, I can't remember, was it was a Thursday, maybe by the time the Speaker got to it, because, again, we were working all throughout the night, and so he hadn't had time. Um, but a lot of times with bills like that, you have to do invitations, and people want to be there, so I think that's what they're working on. I don't have a necessarily specific date yet. So. All right. So the, the other thing that I'm kind of curious about, since I, I don't have any questions from the public yet, um, the COVID-19 response, um, what you got, I, I saw some recent legislation to, to help offset some of those costs and, and provide um, funding for, for folks. Can we go through what's, what's going on right now with COVID relief and from a state level? So, Ken, a lot of that's in flux right now because we're kind of waiting on what, what the federal government is doing or is going to do. So I think it was two weeks ago we passed off the House floor um, – uh, an exemption for income tax for that extra $600 of unemployment uh, insurance. And so that would have said that extra $600 that everybody got this past summer, if they were unemployed, we were not going to take uh, state income tax on that. Um, so after we did that, then the federal government changed theirs and they said they're not going to tax the first 10000 I believe $300 uh, per year in unemployment uh, unemployment income. And so the way that our tax law is set up and coupled with the federal government, that automatically means that the state of Iowa is not going to do the same. So some of those things that we've been working on, uh, we kind of have to hit the brakes on and see what the federal government is doing. Uh, because in addition to that, the federal government is um, is kicking in substantial money into the state of Iowa. And we are looking at how we can spend that and what we can spend it on and what we can do that is beneficial uh, to groups. Earlier this, season, earlier this session, we passed off the House floor $27.2 million for uh, K-12 through schools to help uh, cover the cost of being in person this past fall, um, and that's sitting over at the Senate, and we're not quite sure what they're going to do with it. And just kind of to reiterate, yeah, so, you know, we got the money. There were some stipulations in federal that you couldn't use it for, you know, tax relief type stuff and how you could spend it. We, we reached out to get some more clarification. We thought we had some answers. Um, again, then, of course, the answers changed. And so we've just really been watching and seeing what we are allowed to do with it and how we can actually um, use it correctly. But, yeah, the $27.2 million was um, a great um, thing we passed off the House floor. I believe the Senate has not moved that yet, if I'm correct, as well as the unemployment. We are still waiting for the Senate to move that as well. But those have both passed out of the House. All righty, and we are joined by Senator Rosenboom. Good morning. Good morning. So I'll open this up same as I did for the representatives. If, if you have any comment about about this past couple of weeks and, and where we're at right now, just kind of give your constituents an update. Well, let me apologize first off. I, th I was celebrating a day off. I guess that was a mistake. Simply didn't have this in my calendar. I, uh, I'm caught flat-footed. But I will say that uh, we recently passed the bill that did two rather major things. Remove the triggers from the tax cut that we had passed in 2018. So uh, those tax cuts will move forward now. And then it also eliminated the inheritance tax. Uh, there's many other things we're working on, both at the macro level, the, bi the big items that are on the minds of all Iowans and that each of us are working on other items that are important also to maybe smaller groups of people, but they're very important in the fabric of Iowa. So since I'm tardy, I'll just let you get back into the flow you were in. All righty. Well, Senator, we, uh, we're getting ready to talk about the bottle bill, and I know we have some grocers and other folks around here that have quite the interest in that. So any of you guys be able to update us a little bit about where the bottle bill is at? Well, I guess I walked right into this one. Uh, I will tell you what I know. There are, I don't know how many bills in the House, I think maybe four. There are three in the Senate. And on the Senate side, there's only one that has legs, and that's the one I think that, that I introduced uh, about a month ago. And to recap what it does, it's markedly different from all the other bills that we've seen over the years. 
uh, in a very fundamental sense. But the main features are this. Number one, it removes the bottlers or the dis distributors from the equation altogether. They are the ones now that essentially collect the nickels that are deposited and then they redistribute those nickels when cans and bottles are redeemed. They also hold the nickel, keep the nickel that is never redeemed. And we think that's in the neighborhood of 28 to 30 million dollars a year. So we take them out of the equation. We remove the mandate for retailers to uh, take it back in the empty used cans and bottles, which is a huge component of this legislation and one I know that the grocers and the retailers would, would appreciate. We, re, we keep the deposit at five cents, and that five cent deposit, instead of being collected by the bottlers and distributors, as it has been, will now go to the Division of uh, Alcoholic Beverages Division of the state of Iowa. They are, they have the infrastructure, the working knowledge of how to administer, retain those, those nickels, and um, we think that's, I think that's a better place for those nickels to go. And those unredeemed nickels that I mentioned earlier that amount to 28 to $30 million a year will eventually go back to the taxpayer trust fund. So the taxpayers are able to benefit from from those rather than uh, what is now the bottlers. So that's the fundamentals of the program. And I, I'm, tell, I'm taking this approach because I've seen a lot of complicated solutions come and go. None of them are successful because they all take arrows from different directions. Um, I think this reduces the conversation to a simple, a couple of simple fundamental facts and then uh, perhaps that'll be a way to uh, successfully update the bottle bill. You know, this obviously has been an issue for several, several years. Um, and it seems like every time you get all the different entities, the bottlers, the, the distributors, and everybody, there's always these finger pointing things. Um, I have heard that there's maybe been, even though they get together and then everybody just leaves really mad, um, but I have heard that there's been some talk and we might have a couple of compromises coming um, and some solutions. I do not know all the details to that, but I'm. My understanding is we may hear a little bit of an update next week in the House uh, from some of the discussions that are um, that have been happening. So hopefully we can know more next week. And I'd like to follow that up with one other comment that Holly touched on. Sometimes we deal with issues by legislation. Sometimes the discussions force two different sides to get together. And that may be the case in this, in this instance. I believe that my bill, which has already passed out of one committee, I think it has a chance to get out of ways and means. And if it does, I honestly think this bill will pass out of the Senate on a bipartisan basis. That would be by far the loudest signal ever sent to the uh, different uh, opponents in this discussion, and that in itself would be enough to force them to come to the table, I believe. All right. Well, we've gotten a couple questions from viewers, and they're and they're curious about the charter schools and uh, which communities are trying to create charter school. Um, what's the mission of the school, and and what? I guess why aren't they able to do it locally? There's also why will charter schools get public funding? So those are those are some things that the the community is asking about that particular legislation. Perfect. Okay, so with the charter schools, they are public charter schools. They're going to have to go by several of the same regulations that our public schools have. But one of the things we've probably learned is, you know, we. Everyone has talked about parents' choice. We dealt with kid, parents that wanted to send their kid to school and it was closed and couldn't and that type of stuff. As well as I think a lot of us know maybe there's different emphasis in um, what children need to learn or want to learn or how they even learn. Um, and so the way that this bill was wrote, it removed some of the red tape, but there's still 27 different pieces that they have to put together to be able to be approved um, 
to even open. We don't necessarily know what schools are or communities are looking at doing this, but it's going, I mean, the founding board, I guess is what it's called, right? The founding board? Founding group. Founding group. Um, you know, is, will work, you know, my estimation is it could take a couple of years even to get this even in the process. We don't know what communities are looking at this, but we have learned the last year and in, even in my government oversight that there are communities that have no other choice. Um, and they maybe don't want to go to a religious-based school or whichever. But a charter school doesn't necessarily have a specific, this is what it's about. That's what the founding group would establish. But it has to have community support is one of them. It has to have a need. Um, I can't remember all 27 off the top of my head right now. But there's several different pieces that go into that. So. Well, and to touch on Holly, um, what Holly said, uh, there's, there's, charter schools are there to address a specific issue or to target a certain group. And so there's some charter schools, when you look at what happens in the, throughout the nation, there's some charter schools um, that look at underperforming schools or uh, perhaps children who live in poverty, or uh, there are some charter schools that maybe are a STEM high school or something like that, or devoted to the arts or something. So there's, there's all sorts of different models out there. And what this bill does is it allows the local communities to decide, you know, what, what, what their community needs. Now, are we going to see a charter school pop up in Oskaloosa or Pella or North Mahaska or anywhere? Probably not. We're probably looking at these in maybe some of the larger areas. Um, but when you look throughout the country, they, they address all sorts of different needs. To, to the question of why is there public funding, and it's because they're public schools. They have to take every kid that applies to go to that school. The only way they don't have to is if they run out of space. And even that case, they have to go by a lottery. So they're not picking and choosing. They're not saying, we're not going to educate these, uh, these children. They have to take every child that applies. They have to educate those kids. They got to meet all those children's needs. And so really what this does is it gives the schools the ability to be flexible to maybe target a certain area. Like I said, you know, some places in the country we have high schools that are uh, devoted to kids that maybe go on into engineering. We have high schools or elementaries that are devoted to school, uh, kids in the, um, in the inner cities or maybe kids that are English as a second language learner. So uh, there's really that flexibility to address those needs. All right, Connie Van Pollen's asked a, a follow-up question on the, on the bottle bill and she, and she wonders, where will, redemp where will redemptions occur for bottles and cans under that? Oh, thanks, Connie, for as as asking the question because I really overlooked a very key component of this legislation. The other attempt that I'm trying to achieve, the other goal I'm trying to achieve in this is to revitalize the redemption industry. And so this bill calls for that handling fee that has been one penny per container for over 40 years, beginning July 1 would go to two pennies, two cents per container. Then in January of 2023, when the bill is fully implemented, that will go back to one and a half cent handling fee. And, but at that point, the redemption centers will be able to, they will own the, the container the aluminum can, which we believe right now markets uh, prices suggest that's worth another penny per container. So the redemption centers, I believe, will again spring up around Iowa. I have been in contact with many redemption centers around the state. Most of them are small in our rural communities and they're struggling. They're going out of business. Uh, I believe this will, that extra infusion of cash, which we all know needs to be there, I think will revitalize that. And it also, under this legislation, the, uh, the need to separate those cans by distributor goes away. That no longer has to be done. So it's a huge labor-saving component. So all in all, I think it's a nice package. Uh, I do trust the market forces to create those redemption centers in uh, all around Iowa, and that's that's my goal. All right, we have a question from Nick Rule. He says, according to 
let me see, according to the Iowa College Foundation, 70% of Iowa students that go to Iowa private colleges stay in Iowa after graduation. With Iowa's need to keep younger people in the state, what is an update on the Iowa tuition grant, and do you see this grant growing in the next few years? So I think that's a great question, Nick, and it's one that we struggle every year with when we look at funding our community colleges, our private colleges, and then our, our region's institutions. And I think both the House and the Senate have really started to take a look at you know, the money that we give to the regions uh, per student versus the ones that we give to community colleges and then through the Iowa tuition grant. And so I don't, I don't sit on the Education Appropriations Subcommittee, so I'm not sure exactly what the conversations are, but I do know, uh, at least on our side of the building, uh, there is a concerted effort to maybe focus on the community colleges and the Iowa tuition grant for that exact reason is uh, both of those educate people who tend to stay in Iowa. I'd like to follow up too with that, Nick. Um, we deal with a lot of issues, many of which are controversial and you read about in the newspapers. We also deal with a lot of issues that are not controversial, and the Iowa tuition grant typically is one of those. Everyone up at the Capitol that I know has always been very supportive of that. And to maybe give the uh, viewers here a little better sense of what Dustin just men mentioned, uh, the state of Iowa supports our Regent Universities uh, to the extent that each student gets roughly 10000 I don't remember exactly, it's over $10,000 per year per student for our Regent students. For our uh, the, the Iowa tuition grant that we're talking about right now, uh, the last number that sticks in my mind is around $4,600 per student per year. For our community colleges, it's more like $2,500 per student per year. So that's always been troubling to me that we support some students four times at a four times greater level than we do others and behind each one of those students is a life it's a career and has been noted a couple times both our regent or excuse me our community college students and our private college students stay home stay in Iowa at a far higher rate than do our regent university students so I think that as a state, we need to really wrestle with that going forward. And just to kind of hit a little bit more on that, um, you know, with our community colleges, about 83% of the individuals that attend the community college stay. You're talking over 70% for your private um, colleges here. And our regions are anywhere from 46 to, you know, 48%. Um, and we also need to look at the fact that, you know, in our regent universities, the number of students attending has only grown by 3% over the last few years, where the administration costs have grown by over 25%. Um, and so we need to look at this of the return of investment. You know, we need to grow Iowa. So where is our dollars best spent at? Are we making the right decisions with your tax money to make sure that we grow and invest where we need to? Um, so there's been a lot of different topics of conversation over this and um, just seeing where we can go with this and how we can help. Well, and to add, uh, Nick, one more thing on top of that, prior to session, um, you meet with a lot of groups and you meet with um, you meet with a lot of stakeholders. And so I was in a meeting with the Iowa Student Aid Commission, and they had somebody from the regents, and they had somebody uh, from the private colleges, and that, that somebody was President Mark Putnam from Central. Um, but the regents uh, were very proud that they were the top in the nation or towards the top of the nation with, I believe, a 70% six-year graduation rate. Um, and they were, like I said, towards the top in the nation. The question was asked of the Central College president, what's your four-year graduation rate? And his response was somewhere in the realm of 93 to 94%. Uh, we're talking a six-year graduation rate versus a four-year graduation rate, and we're talking a much higher percentage. So I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. That is not to say that the regions don't play a vital role in our state. Um, I believe that they do. I've attended all three. Um, I've had on my transcripts community colleges, private colleges, and one of the region's institutions. I think they all play a vital role, but I do think that it's time that we start to look at maybe a little bit different way in how we do fund them. All righty. And we have a couple of follow-up questions, uh, once again, on the charter schools. Uh, Kurt Keogh is curious. Uh, um, he asks if there was a my, – my phone just jumped, so – uh, no mechanism for charter schools in the state. Was there no mechanism for charter schools 
in the state. And, and Patricia Fagan then asks, why can public charter schools be founded without having to go to the local school board for approval? If they don't have to follow the same rules as public schools, why do they still get public funding? So um, there is currently a mechanism in the state, and it, it's got to run through the local school board. And so I think the reason why we don't see a lot of uh, charter schools is, is pretty obvious, and that is um, the local school boards would essentially be saying, yeah, we want some competition. And, and you know, just human nature is we're not going to do that. And so that's why we created a second path. The first path is still there, but we create a second path that they can go directly to the Board of Education. Board of Education is appointed by the governor um, and I believe confirmed by the Senate. Yes. Um, and we've had local people from Oskaloosa on that board before. So um, that's the reason why uh, the current system isn't really working and we don't see that many. We only have two in the state of Iowa. Um, but as I said, the reason why they, they are public charter schools is they are ha they do have to accept every single student that comes there. And I think uh, a lot of people get them confused with private schools who do get to pick and choose and do get to have different missions. But under this proposal, they have to accept every student. Uh, they cannot be religious. They can't be anything like that. And they must be a nonprofit organization. And so um, I think you know, that's the key component. They have to accept every student. And if they are not successful, parents aren't going to send their kids there. I mean, that's just, you know, uh, simply put, uh, if they're not successful in educating those kids, parents are not going to send their kids there. And so it's another option for parents. Um, and I think it's a great option for the state of Iowa. And it should also be known, they're not allowed to charge tuition for students to attend. And um, they can be shut down at any time. I mean, they're on a, is it a five-year contract, right? It's a five-year contract. But even within those five years, if they are not following um, some of the requirements and that type of stuff, they can be shut down. But while maybe here it wasn't a, a brought forth, but what was brought forth was parents want choices. And so this is one of the ways that we can provide choices. It would be up to the parents to, you know, to create the founding group to set this forward. They have to have community support um, where you could set a private school without the entire community being behind you. But this, you have to have um, some community support behind you, I think, which is also really an important factor in that. Um, you can specialize in different things. You know, it could be a dyslexic school even, where you focus more on your style of teaching is going to be Wilson's learning. Um, it could be a variety of different ways um, it can be set up. So that's another reason. Well, the, the Senate took uh, another approach to this earlier on in the session, and, and I applaud the House for taking this step. I think we need to step back and ask ourselves why we even have, have these discussions every year. The reason is because uh, I noticed through all these conversations, it, it focuses on the schools. The conversation centers around the schools. I want to encourage you to think about the students, the kids themselves. And the reason these discussions take place every year is that because uh, in, in some cases, there are failing schools, as identified by the school systems themselves, the Department of Education, both the state and the federal level. So there are failing schools, and there are children trapped, absolutely trapped in those schools with no other option. That's why we have these discussions. We also have, unfortunately, situations in the state where some of the public schools have chosen to pursue curriculum options that are at best highly controversial and at worst they are just a slap in the face to many of Iowa's parents and children. So uh, I have my, my view on school choice is, is not new. You, most people know what it is. I believe that parents and families should have more choices than just the public schools in those situations where they seriously want another option. And I'm going to go right back to Mr. Rosenman. There's a follow-up on the bottle bill here. Jennifer Keough, in regard to the bottle bill, you mentioned that the redemption centers would keep all of the bottles after 2023. Does this mean the bottlers are not really recycling the plastic and glass bottles? Any consideration on banning containers that are not recyclable? No, that's one of those issues that I that I'm intentionally avoiding in this uh, in this bill, 
And the reason I'm avoiding is because those are the types of things that always, always bog down the, the discussion and that always prevent us from making really good changes in the, in the bottle bill. You have to remember one basic fact. The worst enemy of the bottle bill is the status quo. It's not working well. It's still a popular concept in Iowa. I support it, but it's not working well because it hasn't been changed in 42 years. So the, the whole idea of my approach is to make those fundamental changes that will restore the vitality of the redemption centers and get that unredeemed nickel away from private coffers into the public realm so, and then we can have those discussions. I believe if we, if we can get, make this step, then we can have those discussions about plastics, about whether the nickel deposit should be something else. So those, uh, with all due respect, those, those things I'm intentionally staying away from because I've watched those concepts c come year after year after year and they always fail. So I'm gonna take this new approach. All righty, and uh, we have one from Allison. Um, this is for Representative Brink and Height. Can you explain why you voted the way you did for House File 802? Senator Rosenblum, how are you going to vote when this comes to the Senate floor and why? Ken, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of numbers that are thrown at us, so if Allison would tell you what bill that is, then we can answer her question. I apologize. We just don't know what the numbers are sometimes. All right. Well, we'll circle back to that after I get some clarification. And they change throughout session, too, so they get really confusing. Okay. Yep, like I said, we'll circle back to that here. The other one that's come in is uh, from Douglas Doak, and, and he goes, what is Iowa's position on Miller Meek's seat that they are trying to turn? I don't know that the state of Iowa has a particular position on that. Um, I think individuals do. Uh, I, what I can answer is what, what I think. Um, you know, I think we have a good process in the state of Iowa. Uh, that process showed through, I believe, three counts that Marionette Miller Meeks was uh, the winner, albeit by only six votes. Um, and so that's who I think should be, uh, should be seated in Congress. Well, thanks for the question. Mr. Doak, I, uh, Dustin's right. The, I, the state doesn't have a position. I do. I've served with both Rita Hart and Marionette Miller Meeks in the Iowa Senate. We have a process that's regarded as one of the cleanest and safest systems in the country. Both candidates, this election went through all the normal channels until. Rita Hart lost, and then she chose to ignore the Iowa approach to settling this dispute without going to the Iowa system, what the, the normal routine, the normal channel for these uh, disputes to, to take, and she chose to go to an extremely partisan Nancy Pelosi to uh, help make that decision. I believe that's fundamentally wrong. And to the question about how Iowa feels about it, I don't think, regardless of party, I don't think Iowa feels very good about this at all. Yeah, I, um, again, you know, the 22 votes um, or ballots, you know, in every county, each party picks one individual to represent them and they pick a third and, the, you know, this is three times that it was chosen, even again, by six votes. But I just think that... Um, in my opinion, we need to stick with that because it was, again, three times checked. Um, everything was put out through the legal way, and so I'm sad that she skipped the last step here in Iowa. Uh, as an Iowan, I'm sad that she herself skipped that. So. Well, and I would just say, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the process, that recount board, uh, the Mahaska County Board was actually made up of former state representative uh, Eric Palmer uh, and former state senator uh, Tom Riley, two Democrats, and, and then one person from, uh, from the, the Republican, uh, that Marionette Miller Meeks campaign pick. So um, that's how good our process is, that even in our, in Mahaska County, we've got two Democrats, one Republican, and um, they came up with uh, the number they do, and that's why I'm very confident that the results that we have are the accurate results. And, and just a little programming note, um, 
the plan is to have Marionette Miller Meeks here on the 17th of April in, in your guys' hot seat. So, well, maybe you can call in and ask her those tough questions then. So I had a little clarification um, on the uh, the House File 802 and, and the, uh, asking Mr. Hyde and, and Holly Brink how they would vote on that or how, why they voted on that. Pardon me. Um, so that is the Divine Concepts Bill. Are we ringing a bell? D divisive concepts. Oh, divisive. There um, we go. Yeah. Divine concept sounds like uh, yeah. Well, something we're not we going to we're, we're not gonna talk religion here, but the, the um, so right the divisive concepts bill. And if you actually read the bill, basically what it says, and I think uh, Kay Henderson with Radio Iowa's uh, headline the next morning caught it perfectly, is it says you can't teach stereotyping. In, um, when you're teaching diversity training, you can't say that one race is superior to the other, that one race is particularly racist, that one sex or gender is superior to the other, or that one sex is sexist. That's what it did, um, and that to me seems like common sense. Um, my understanding is that a senator, a Democratic senator, uh, voted for the exact same concept in the Senate, uh, uh, Senator Kornbach, and his his answer was, what, if you read the bill, how can you not vote for that? How can you not support that? It does not prevent diversity training. It does not prevent implicit bias training. What it says is you can't tell people, because you're white, you're racist. Because you're black, you're racist. That's all it says, and to me, that's an easy concept to say yes to. And I'm just the same thing. It was very simple, very easy. I mean, it's just, you know, Going both sides and teaching, um, you know, not one side is superior, one side is not. Um, it was very simple, so I encourage everyone to read the bill if they um, have questions about it as well. All right. Well, I'm going to pick on Mr. Rosenboom once again because we had a had an interesting conversation uh, in regards to uh, deer and the deer population once before, and and uh, I know that I, I've read a few posts somewhere. There's, you know, of course some. Some hunters, hunter groups that are upset because they feel as though that it would cull the herd that they've they've come to appreciate. So can you take us a little further into that and, and let us know where we're at with that? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, as a prologue here, you become known for certain things, at least in certain years. I'm just thankful I'm not known as the turtle guy anymore. Uh, that predates these two, and they don't know what that's about. But... Uh, Fair question, and what's driving, what drove, what, what prompted me to write the bill was after, now in my ninth year of representing Senate District 40, I've become more and more aware of deer populations in, especially in the southern two tiers of Iowa counties. Uh, I'm down there a lot, and I've worked with the DNR for all nine of those years. I've sat down with their wildlife division manager every year for nine years, and we talk about deer populations, and he talks to me about their, their quotas and their population studies and their hunting programs. And, and that's all well and good. I've always deferred to him. He's a smart man. He's, he's uh, got his Ph.D. in wildlife biology. But on the other side of that were always people in my ear complaining about the overpopulation of deer. It had to do with crop damage. It had to do with vehicle damage. Right now, I think if you look carefully, you'll find nine or ten deer carcasses on Highway 163 between Oskaloosa and Tumwa. You can find nine more between Albion and Centerville. Uh, I have always deferred to the DNR's control of deer population and I've always deferred to the hunter's wishes. We value the hunter. Uh, we're, we're known, Iowa's known as the top white-tailed deer destination in the country. And that's, that's fine. It does a lot of good things. But as I told the director of the DNR about a month ago, I said, everything we do up here is a balance. And it's my judgment after all these years of looking at this that the deer population in some parts of Iowa, not all, but in some parts of Iowa, it's out of control. It's out of balance. So the bill, the main part of the bill calls for a study by the DNR to uh, review deer population historically back to 1970. More importantly, it calls for the DNR to conduct a, an environmental impact assessment and an economic impact assessment 
of overpopulation of deer. And I don't want the DNR to do that in their own little world. I want Iowa State University Extension to be involved in that study. I want the Iowa DOT to be involved, and I want the Iowa Insurance Division to be involved. Because I think we need to, while we defer to the wishes and the desires of the hunting community, we also have to factor in greater Iowa, all Iowans. And as I illustrated earlier, there is a tremendous amount of uh, damage done to vehicles. There are safety issues related to every one of those deer accidents. And so that's the main part of the bill. Beyond that, it does two things that I, I know have the hunting community upset. One is I'm creating another depredation or calling for another depredation season in late in mid-January after all the hunting seasons have come and gone, all the hunters have had their shot, and if the, on a county by county basis, if the DNR quota for deer harvest was not met, for instance, in Appanoose County last year, the quota was 2,700, but only 2,200 were harvested. That's 500 unharvested deer that they planned on uh, harvesting. So under my bill, the, those there would be tags issued, I think, at a cost of $2 each for farmers and hunters to use uh, efficient weapons, um, center fire rifles and that sort of thing to help the DNR meet their quota. And then the last thing, and this is the one that's drawing all the fire, the current penalty for illegally taking a deer, there, there's, a, there's uh, scheduled fines and those are in the neighborhood of $400 for, for an infraction. In addition to this, that fine, the criminal fine, there is a civil penalty. Uh, and right now, that civil penalty for taking, for instance, uh, uh, a gray wolf or a, a, a gray fox or a red fox or a beaver, that's $200. If you were to take an animal from the endangered species, uh, the civil penalty would be $1,000. If you take an antlerless deer, swan, or crane, the civil penalty is $1,500. That seems badly out of whack to me, so I'm, I'm reducing that civil part of the penalty from $1,500 to $200, although I've, I've agreed to an amendment that will probably bring that up to $500. So that's where it stands today, and uh, that's what's behind the bill. And we have another question that came in, and Mr. Rosenboom seems to be on the hot seat today. So uh, this one is from Charlie Comfort. It says, if your previous election processes were the cleanest and safest in the nation, end quote, in 2024 Marionette Miller Meeks election, why, Senator Rosenboom, did you support a bill that changed Iowa's election laws in the name of voter integrity? Doesn't that statement contradict your vote? To quote uh, a famous man sitting to my left, Dustin Height, I think a month ago he said something like this, just because I didn't have an accident ye uh, yesterday doesn't mean I don't fasten my seatbelt. Doesn't mean I don't fasten my seatbelt today. We keep elections clean when we see problems both within the state and outside of our borders. Clearly in, 2000, in 2020, a lot of us are upset with what took a place in a lot of a lot of other states. To specifically, I I think you you asked about things like closing down the window from absentee voting. From I got to remember now we we were at 29 days and now we've taken it down to 20 days, if I recall. That seems very reasonable to me. Uh, the longer that time period is open, I think the greater the chance for chicanery and, and stuff. It's, you simply, I, I, the, the national average time is 19, or 18 days or 18 or 19. We're doing 20. I think that's reasonable. My mom's 99 years old. She's never complained to me about difficulty voting absentee. There was a recent election in uh, just south of us in Ottumwa here for uh, Miller Meeks' old Senate seat, that was an 18-day election. That was an 18-day election, and there were still over 4,000 absentee ballots. So I, I guess it's just a matter of keeping everything tight, reasonable, logical, and safe. All right. 
Well, I have it. It's about 20 after 9, so I'm going to start winding this down. Um, this will be you guys' last opportunity to uh, address your constituents this year. So uh, we'll go ahead and open that up and, and let you guys make some final comments and, you know, and talk to your constituents. So however you want to do this. Well, Ken, I'm going to take this opportunity um, to remind uh, Iowans, remind the people watching what a great state this is, uh, and to celebrate our history. Uh, coming up on Monday is, I believe, the 100th anniversary of the Iowa flag, and they're having a little get-together over at Knoxville um, that I assume Ken and I probably won't be able to make. But um, the 100th anniversary of the Iowa flag, uh, the lady who created that, and I apologize, I don't remember her name, um, but anyway, was from Knoxville, so that's a great thing. And then uh, later this year, on December 28th, will be the 175th anniversary of the state of Iowa. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a great thing. The state of Iowa has been around for 175 years. And, uh, you know, uh, take that together with the flag and the motto on the flag, our liberties are pr we prize and our rights we will maintain, I think, uh, shows um, – shows the uh, integrity of, of the state of Iowa and the, the character of the people. So um, I'm just taking this opportunity to to mention those two things. Uh, I think uh, they, they kind of gotten lost between COVID and everything else that's going on. But those are two great things that are happening in the state of Iowa this year and certainly would encourage people to celebrate and participate in those. Well, I will just I, – I find my mind works – in a way that I like to go back to big pictures, to take 30,000 foot view of things. And, and this seems appropriate right now. We, we've discussed a number of specific bills this morning. And what's very noticeable if you do this job for a while is that any particular bill seems to, uh, that's controversial, has a, has a flashpoint. It has a a piece of it that seems to draw all the fire. That was true of the deer bill, that's true of the bottle bill. It was true of this 802, I think, that you mentioned. Um, my, my point is this, uh, we are very deliberative up there. We These bills all get looked at from many different angles. And it's always interesting, the uh, small piece that seems to f we find in the newspapers and that we hear so much about. but. We try hard to always have the big picture in mind. And with our, uh, we didn't talk much about it. I mentioned a little bit about the removing the triggers and the uh, uh, doing away with the inheritance tax in Iowa. Those are big deals. They are generational. Our tax rate, our income tax rate in Iowa will come back from eight something percent to six something percent. That's a big deal for everyday Iowans. And we're only able to do that because the last five years, we have worked diligently day in and day out to control state spending. So that means that everything we, every budget bill that we pass, we, we look at in the context of the bigger picture of the whole budget, and we look at it in the context of what does this look five years from now. When I came up there several years ago, it was always a year to year thing. Where can we find money to do this or that? We have always taken a long-term approach to this, and that has enabled us now to finally see the fruits in our labor so we can actually reduce the tax rate for Iowans. That's important. And I'll touch on a couple of different topics here. When you know we're talking about the budget, you know, a, a bipartisan group named us number one to withstand the pandemic financially, and I think that we need to remember that um, you know we do the best we can and are, and really um, spend a, a lot of time making sure that we make fiscally conservative budgets to make sure that we can fund and fund with what we say we're going to give each of these you know different entities. Um, you know, when it comes to education. We say we're going to give you this much, and that's what we actually stand and behind, and we don't deappropriate you later. Um, and so I think that's really important. So when we are looking at some of these bigger picture items, we do put a lot of thought into that. Um, and when it comes to bills, I think it's also important that we don't go looking for trouble or looking for problems to solve. Everyday Iowans bring them to us. You know, when, when I held the government oversight um, committee for the Ames School District. I didn't go to Ames and see how their school district was. Parents, teachers, community members brought the problems to us. 
Um, and so it, it's a great way to uh, be involved. So if you do have ideas, you know, make sure you reach out to us. Um, I'll give a shout out to a uh, senior here at Oskaloosa, who's a page in the Senate, Holly. Her dad's a police chief. Uh, had her 18th birthday, yep. Um, so my daughter actually interviewed him and he was telling me about a problem, but also saying that one of the senators said, hey, if you guys have any ideas, you know, bring them forth. And so in talking with him, I said, we kind of came up with an idea. I'm like, there's her bill. You know, it has to do with being a page and being able to count as a, a government credit for your high school so that you can still participate in sports because she wanted to be on the shooting team. So she had to take classes online and, and try to stay active. And I'm like, there's your bill. You're, this should count as government class. You're learning so much. And so she got with one of the senators. They wrote the bill. It's coming over to the house. I actually asked Dustin if it comes to education, if I could be on that. But that's, you know, an 18-year-old here in Oskaloosa had a problem and she, you know, working through and talking, we found a solution to that. Um, and so um, I just want to let everybody know that, you know, you can be involved. You can get online at legis.iowa.gov. You can watch, you can follow bills, you can see debate live. Um, and I can tell you, it's probably going to give you a lot of better information than you're going to see in the 30 second news clip um, <laughs> at night. And so feel free to reach out and ask us the why behind anything. So thank you. And thanks, uh, Ken, Ginger, uh, Allison, and Andy uh, for all the work that you guys do putting this together. I know this year is even but more difficult, so I just want to say thank you from all three of us um, for all the work that you guys do. All righty. Well, I'm going to be kind of sad. We, this means that we're starting to come to the end of eggs and issues for 2021, but hopefully this means that next year we'll be back in the confines of Smoky Row which I'll, as an audio guy, I'll be fighting the coffee grinder, but those are things that I look forward to. Um, so once again, thanks to Holly Brink, Ken Rosenboom, and Dustin Height for, you know, taking a day off and turning it into, uh, you know, some information for folks that have questions. So we greatly appreciate that. And the seat's always hot and never comfortable. Once again, thanks to Smokey Row and Midwest One Bank for the coffee this morning. Uh, Andy and Allison McGuire for helping to search and, and curate questions and send them my way. And the Mahaska Chamber and Development Group for, for their sponsorship of this. I, I think everybody agrees that this has been, uh, you know, a rather important part of, of the community and, and helping people to understand what happens off, not just at the State House, but locally. And uh, it's been an institution for some time. I'd like to thank Penn Central Mall for. Uh, waking up early with us to help make all of this happen. Um, their folks are always great to help us out. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, my cellmate, I guess studio mate, Joe Millage, KIC, uh, and we use the studios here. Um, and next, the next one, I believe it's April 10th, we'll have the Mahaska Chamber Development Group themselves here answering questions and, and talking about upcoming events. Uh, April 17th should be Marionette Miller Meeks, and uh, until then, I'm Ken Alsop with Oskaloosa News, and we'll look forward to seeing you then.